Today we're discussing this, this subject of, of portraiture. And I'm really, really happy we're working with Intelligence Squared to do this and, and with Tatler. Um, and at this moment in time, as we begin our summer season at Sotheby's, we've got incredible exhibition of lone portraits from Chatsworth downstairs. Our cafe has been taken over by Tatler's Madame Yvonne de portraits. Um, but today what we're doing is a bit different. We're going to explore really uh, this topic of portraiture, the links between traditional portraiture and fashion photography. And this stretches all the way back to the Tudor portraiture, like the wonderful Catherine Parr portrait we have downstairs, right up to the present day covers of magazines like Tatler or Vogue, sorry, Tatler. We'll be asking questions like, what makes any portrait stand the test of time? And what can a portrait tell us about an individual and the world they lived in? And of course, how or why has portraiture survived in the 21st century, in the age of the selfie um, and the Facebook live stream? Why is it that we still, you know, cleave to this idea of a portrait telling and, and immortalizing somebody? So I want to kick off with a little question for all my speakers, just to sort of get the idea of your sense of self, sense of self image. I'd like to know which artist, each of you, you know, bring them through a time machine out of a distant history or pluck them from their studio in New York today. I don't mind. Which artist would you most like to paint your portrait? Helen, can I start with you? Yes, and I'm get, I've made quite a brave choice. I think I'm going to say Jenny Saville because as an artist, I've long admired her work. And I heard her talking about a Rembrandt self-portrait a few years ago, and I just thought it was so insightful. And I think if I asked Jenny to paint me, I would be fascinated to see what she saw. So there we are. Jenny. Now, Sarah, you're not allowed, I'm afraid, to say you'd just like to paint yourself, although I know you're very well known for your self-portrait. You can, and we would, but is there another artist who you would love to immortalize? I'll be happy if you can paint me. I'll paint you. Okay, I'm just joking. But, um, that would be a, probably the cheapest lot Sotheby's ever sold. Okay. <laughs> I will go with Francis Bacon, right? Because he caps here, I think, a little more than just facial features. I think he captures maybe the spirit of that person. Yes. I spent an hour in front of Bacon's portrait of the Pope recently, and... Um, it made you reassess everything, not just about the Catholic Church, but about your own humanity. Now, Lily, who, I mean, I suspect your answer is you wish people would stop uh, immortalizing your image because you've probably been immortalized more than all the rest of us put together. But who, who haven't you been done by that you would love to be painted? I nearly was, um, nearly worked with Lucian Freud and that's a regret that that didn't happen actually. I love, love his work. Um, I mean, if we were going like really historical, maybe Albrecht Dürer, um, I actually quite like Louise Bourgeois. I mean, I know she, she doesn't do portraits. She does portraits that were of hands, for example, but that's more actually just because I'd love to hang out with her and spend some time. So I think, yeah, I might have. We had, um, we had Bella Freud here um, two days ago with Nicholas Cullen discussing the process of being painted by Lucien. And I suspect you would have found it a very lengthy and traumatic experience, judging from what Bella said. So Jamie, who, who, could, we, uh, who could we get to very good question. knock you up? Um, at home, I have a very nice book called Fertile Image, which is actually a book done by Paul Nash, but it's not his paintings, it's actually his photographs. And towards the end of his life, he started taking a lot more pictures and all of the pictures are kind of like a very normal things like a root of a tree. And then he'd photograph some stones plonked on top of each other, which inspired some of his paintings. And actually, I have no idea what a portrait by him would look like. So I think it would be quite wonderful to my really portrait. Good, I mean, you can turn portraits into landscape, just like a printer. Yeah. yeah. There came a time when artists would choose a sitter and the, the power dynamic shifted. Um, so what, you know, what's the, what's unique about that? Why, why are artists drawn to particular sitters? Yeah, that, that's a really, really good d d d difference to make, actually, to make that distinction. And actually, funnily enough, Sarah touched on this when we were talking before we did the interview for Tatler. Um, and you said, Sarah, if I'm right in remembering, um, that you don't like commissions really on the whole because it restricts you in a way because you have to paint for somebody else. What you really want to do is paint what you want to paint. And I thought that was very interesting and that picks up on that point. Um, an example here though is one that Reynolds chose to paint himself. And this is the very famous portrait of Mai, the Polynesian um, who came to England uh, on one of Captain Cook's voyages from Tahiti in 1774 and this was a huge cultural moment and of course 
Reynolds liked to think of himself as a history painter, so it's no surprise that he chose to paint this sitter. And you can't see all the detail, but actually it's fascinating. He's given him slightly classical looking dress, but he even records the tattoos on his hands, which I don't know whether that's the earliest tattoo in a painting. But, <laughs> um, but anyway, he, what was very interesting, this was a fantastic, he, Reynolds, was very, was thrilled with this portrait and it's huge, but it didn't find a buyer, which is interesting. And it stayed in his studio, so it was still in his studio on the time of his death in the 1790s. So, you know, it does suggest that actually if you want to paint portraits, it's worth, you know, being commissioned. A similar, actually, one is a sergeant. This one here. And the sitter there, uh, or the subject, I can say, is um, Virginie Gautreau. And she was the wife of a wealthy banker in Paris. And sergeant saw her and just said, I would like to paint that woman. And he, I think he was drawn to her lines, he said, and the sort of violet tones of her flesh. Um, so he painted this, um, but it was not a success at all. Uh, she didn't like it, and more importantly, her mother hated it. And so I wonder whether that's why that previous portrait was referred to as Portrait of Madame X. Perhaps she refused to have her name attributed to it. Anyway, I don't know about that. And this one I just wanted to allude to finally, because um, it's a Reynolds portrait again. It's at Wadston, and it's a portrait of the actress, um, Frances Abington. And what's interesting about that, it sort of describes the relationship between sitter and artist because she was very celebrated. So it was obviously good for him, for his currency, to paint her, which he did often. But she also wanted to use his portrait and the engravings that were made after it to publicise herself, rather in the manner of the social media. Um, and so she sent this portrait back. It was done in the six, uh, 1760s. She sent it back in the early 1770s and said, please, will you repaint my hairstyle and my dress so I can continue to use it? And he did. Well, Lily, can I turn to you? Because, you know, these are portraits of, of a range of people whose likenesses have endured, but there are so many people who, are, who haven't because, you know, getting your portrait painted is either an expensive process or, or a very random one. Um, if you look back through kind of the canon of art history, who's missing? Who, whose faces don't we see? <laughs> like probably 99% of humanity, I would say. Um, as you just alluded to, I mean, it was a very expensive process historically to, to commission paintings. And so it's predominantly the wealthy that we're seeing. And then obviously there are exceptions when artists made particular choices. Um, and it's also a very male gaze. I mean, there are plenty of, of, of women, um, female artists, who've been sort of overlooked in art, in, in art history, but because of the economic, political, social realities, it's, it's dominated by, um, by the male gaze. Um, and I think it's very interesting, uh, yeah, looking at Manet's Olympia, that's seen in, in art historical terms as quite, as, as quite a pivotal um, moment where we're, like the women who'd been historically represented usually as an object within um, paintings, she's understood to be taking more agency with the gaze that she has and the role that she has. And you start seeing this turning point where women's representation and in images increasingly change, but also because of socioeconomic changes, women were also increasingly playing a role as artists. And um, so from, yeah, from this time onwards, we see more and more kind of female gazes and then different representations of women within imagery. And of course, with the photography and the democratization of portraiture, that's kind of radically changed the landscape. And so today it's not in any way elite, like such an elite thing to be able to have your portrait taken. In fact, actually, anyone can do it. <laughs> so photography, it changed everything, didn't it? Um, and we, we've never looked back. But what, what are the, you know, you, you must have worked with some of the greatest photographers in the world. This is the unashamed bit of, you know, digging into the past. Um, what are, who have you most enjoyed working with? What's, what's the sort of, what's so special about the great capturers of an image, you know, when you're, you are not only there perhaps as the, as the medium, but you are actually conscious of working with somebody who wants to get something out of you? Well, here's one I prepared earlier. Um, <laughs> this picture was taken by my mother, um, who's an artist and actually made, has made her living, um, through portraiture largely. And so had made plenty of um, sketches and photographs of me growing up. So even before I started modeling, actually, 
I was being captured by my mother. Um, and um, uh, yeah, we go on to the next one. Yeah, thank you. So I've worked with a whole range of photographers. I've been very lucky to work with many, many uh, different photographers through my fashion career and, and other things. And I think it's interesting, it's been interesting for me to observe how different different photographers approaches are and um with tim walker as an example the i i would i mean the the image with the with the rose is is more of a kind of classic portrait but i actually don't consider his work portraiture for the most part because i feel like he has such a clear vision with his image images that i'm sort of just like me and the other models would just be kind of accessories or performers within that landscape we're really trying to help him create a, a whole world rather than the image trying to capture our essence if that makes sense um but then you have other um photographers like i had the great fortune of working with Irvin penn who um for me this is a portrait or it feels like a portrait and it was a very particular experience um and very memorable experience taking it we shot it when he was already very very old um i can't remember his exact age but it was not too long before he died and um it was on in new york on fifth avenue we went up to his studio at the top of the building and was there for quite a few hours the portrait was done for american vogue and um he was it was like a completely silent room where he hardly said a word and you could have heard a pin drop like everyone was being very kind of respectful and quiet um helping him to to get the image he wanted he was shooting film, of course, and of course we've seen a huge transition with digital and the way that's changed how photographers work. Um, and it went on for, in my memory, hours where he kept trying to take the picture and not being happy, leaving, I would be taken off, change again, come back. And then he was giving me very, very, very minute and particular directions. And at some point I remember thinking like, oh my gosh, like, are we ever gonna get this to work? And then, and eventually he was like, okay, we've got it. And he left. And then they printed out the contact sheet and it was such a magical moment because I looked through the contact sheet and the last two images, something had happened. And there was a kind of magic in the last few images. And I just loved that he'd seen that in his eye. You know, he didn't have a digital screen or a phone to check the imagery. He was able to to recognize it in the moment. That, that was the moment. It sounds like you yeah. had the um, experience you might have had with Lucian Freud. Maybe, <laughs> a different one. Um, I thought it was worth mentioning the fact that because of photography's disruptor of portraiture, so if portraiture was classically a way of recording the image and sharing the image before we had the ability to do that photography. Photography's obviously massively disrupted that. And what's the point of portraiture now? And like, it's actually amazing, I think, that portraiture sort of survived considering the disruption of photography. Jamie, can I turn to you? You describe yourself as both a documentary photographer and a fashion photographer. So. Uh, sort of how did you get into photography and, and which of those how do you how do you balance that uh yeah i i it's very strange how i got into photography i studied uh forensic science and criminal investigation at university okay and they had a whole street of mock crime scene houses and every friday morning we would go in and collect evidence bring the evidence back to the, the lab and we would document it very objectively with a digital camera and that was the first time ever that photography came into my life and what I loved about it so much was that it, I could just sort of fiddle around with the camera. And in, in the past, I'd never been creative in any way. I'd never kind of used my hands. I, was, I didn't make anything. So as soon as I started fiddling around with the camera, it really felt like I was, I was making something. And then I kind of went into the dark room and I started spending a lot of time printing. Um, and I just fell in, love with, fell in love with taking pictures, basically. Um, and this picture here, straight away, I kind of because I was a year behind when I changed course, I thought, right, if I just go out and I walk around with this camera and I just ask people to take their portrait, I'm going to, I'm going to learn a lot. Um, and what was so interesting approaching a stranger is that it's, it's incredibly awkward and it's, and it's very nerve wracking. Um, and I kind of, I just really enjoyed that experience. And I liked that kind of funny exchange that you have with a stranger for a minute and then you carry on and you meet someone else. Um, do they ever say no? Yeah, a lot. And it was interesting because I started using a bigger camera and then I used a tripod and I, instead of having a camera up in front of my face, I used a camera where I was kind of a bit more open and it really affected the way that people would respond to me and people started to say yes, basically. Well, the um, tripod was the key, was it? Oh, sorry. The tripod was the key. Yeah, it, it really was. It was like, and also it, I, I, I noticed that if I run up to someone and say, you have an amazing face, it would really freak them out. But if I said, 
if I was like, oh, you have an amazing haircut or your, or your hat's really interesting or, or, or you've got a funny jumper on, that would just open them up a little bit. This is pickup lines 101. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, Next auction, I'm going to take a tripod along. Yeah. Would you like to bid? Here's my tripod. <laughs> uh, but it worked. And, um, and that's kind of, and then when I moved to London, I got into fashion photography and I basically, I wanted to keep it very close to the way that I worked by myself. So one of the first pictures that I took for a fashion magazine was this picture here, where we took a bag of clothes up to Newcastle and we would just stop people in the street and said, would you like to wear this? And this girl actually had, she had a flowery dress on and she was kind of with her parents. And I mean, I, it's amazing. They said, yes. And we just said, oh, we'd love to put your daughter in this big blue, blue Calvin Klein suit. And they were like, yeah, sure. And she was like, yeah, I'd love to. Ran behind a bush, put it on and then came out and transformed. And it was like her whole character just went somewhere completely different. And that was where the penny dropped and was like, you can, you know, if you, if you have some clothes and you can put it onto someone and, com and completely go somewhere else, it was it was it's a fan it was a really it's interesting a, it's experience. It's a swagger portrait, really. Yeah, which you don't get in Newcastle very much. Well, exactly. Yeah. So I think, particularly with portraiture, in my experience, it's kind of just really just being observant, and someone will always do something, however intense the situation is. You were commissioned to paint a portrait of the new king, who is a, a figure who we're already already incredibly familiar with uh, you know he's we have grown up with him as the prince of wales and this transition of charles to the king for the and and painting it for tatler's coronation uh, special you know it's a daunting subject how did you approach this and how did you how did it happen tell us a bit okay so um i must say firstly that i was really really excited and nervous and terrified all at once right when i was asked to paint king charles um i had to do research to find out who king charles was and i'm talking about as a person and i found out the most extraordinary thing you know what that is well i i'm not going to hazard a guess <laughs> the things i know that are extraordinary are probably not right so the most extraordinary thing i found out about king charles was that he's human Yes, and that is what I wanted to capture, that human side of him. Yes. And were you in? Did you, I mean? Were you conscious of the sort of um, all the ghosts of royal portraits of the past? I mean, if you walk down St James's and you see all the sort of kings in their pomp and their coronation rooms, you know, you it seems to me you have rather brilliantly married that sense of the portrait as a medal, the the, the the absolute profile, and yet also revealing the uniform that the man, the human, has to wear. Yes. So I wanted to go opposite to some of the portraits before. I wanted to um, get rid of a lot of the accolades and the medals and the pump behind me in the king. And I wanted to make it more personal. Yes, more personal to King Charles himself. Did you have sittings? With him? Of course not. No. I wish. You wish. I wish. You couldn't get him to come out to spend Of a course day. not. Of course not. And I had a room for him. Oh. Yes, a special room for I him. I'd love to come. Yes. <laughs> but obviously, you know, that as a commission, I understand a commission is not your ideal, but you also paint self-portraits, which, um, you know, so many artists do. What's the difference? What's the desires and the differences between painting someone else and painting yourself? Okay, so painting yourself. I, as the artist, am familiar with my own facial features and also it's a chance for me to really look a little deeper. I like to use the word finding myself going through that journey. Um, a lot of my portraits, I look back at my own family history, right? And because you can't get away from that, can you? You can't escape your past. And that is what a portrait is for me. It's capturing the past, capturing the present. Today, where portraiture and self-portraiture is so uniform and also so much um, a, 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 an indicator of what people think about themselves and what Im images they want to portray, you know, everybody takes selfies, has that killed the portrait? Is it? Is, is, is it now people saying, you know, this is the image I want to show and I'm in control of making it? I mean, Lily, do you think 
there's still a sort of difference between just, you know, this is me versus this is who an artist sees as me. Yeah, I mean, massively. I think if there wasn't that difference, we'd have already lost portraiture because I think that over 100 years ago when photography sort of questioned the role of portraiture fundamentally as like a representation of image, um, I think there was a high risk that portraiture could have died and it didn't, you know, and I think the fact that in spite of photography, um, we continue to commission portraits and artists continue to make them, I think shows its enduring um, interest. And I think that is probably because of what the artist can bring to an image that um, that a camera or a device or even now AI, because um, we're singing AI portraiture, that AI won't, you know, that there is something about the artist's eye, the artist's um, intention that has, that a kind of special, can have a special magic that people will still be interested in. I think we're also interestingly quite narcissistic, right? <laughs> so like the, in, I think it's an interesting question to think about like the selfie culture, but also even that as an extension of portraiture, like why are we so interested in seeing pictures of ourselves and seeing pictures of other humans? You know, I think that's kind of a curious question. It's very difficult to say anybody who's capturing the moment now, partly because there's such diversity and everybody is doing their own thing, different things. And you can't really say in the same way that there's one thing that's predominant now, I think, don't, don't you think? That's why there's so much different, you know, portraiture, fashion photography. I mean, it, it, there are just so many different vehicles for expressing what's going on. At One of my favourite um, areas of collecting is the artist's self-portrait. And there's a gallery at Altra in, in Northamptonshire, Lord Spencer's house, where he has collected, <clears throat> or his family have, self-portraits of artists over the years. And it's really interesting to, to walk through a room of artists' image of themselves. Um, so, I mean, personally, I hope portraiture continues forever because, frankly, I need quite a lot of material to fill my sales. And unless people keep painting and those pictures keep coming up for sale, um, it'll be a disaster for Sotheby's. Um, we've got so many wonderful portraits downstairs, and I'd I encourage you all to go and have a look, but particularly Sarah's portraits. And if you, you know, in a year at Sotheby's, if we had a Rembrandt, uh, three Lucian Freuds, a Canova, that would be a really good year. Well, um, this week we've got all of those together in one room from Chatsworth. Sadly, from my point of view, none of them for sale, but they are all here, so don't miss them on the way out and the Catherine Parr portrait. And I'd like to thank Jamie, Lily, Sarah and Helen for being such interesting panellists, and I hope you really enjoyed your time. Come back and see us over the next couple of weeks. Our sales are gearing up and there'll be more things to see, not all portraits. But please, I encourage you, go home, work hard, commission artists, live on the walls of your children's rooms. Music